Hello, Math 201. Well, welcome to this video lecture on section 2.3, Computing Limits. So let's remind ourselves of what we did last time. So remember, we care about limits because we want to know instantaneous rate of change. We want to know how a function function changes at an instant. We want to know kind of what's, what's happening. Um, and the way that we found limits before was graphically. And so today's lecture, we're going to talk about how to actually compute these limits using analytic methods or kind of algebra, um, so without graphing. And so the kind of way we're going to start this is we're going to start by finding the limit of a linear function. And so a linear function, remember, is just a line. It's the equation of a line, so y equals mx plus b. So if you plug in an x value, it spits out um, some y value, has a slope m, has an intercept b. And what is the limit of any point on a line? Well, it turns out that if you, because lines are these nice, just kind of, uh, I keep using the word continuous, but I guess we don't have continuous yet, but the idea is that it's just, uh, there's no holes in it. There's no jumps, there's no gaps. And so really the limit at any point is just the function value. And so as you get really, really close to A from the left and really, really close to A from the right, they're going to the same point, which is just the function value. And so this is the key kind of starting point we're gonna use that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is just gonna be equal to f of a, which is just ma plus b if our equation is a line. And so for any line, the limit of the line is just plug in the value. And so let's do some examples. Um, and so I already did them for us, but the idea is that this is the equation of a line. If I wanna take the limit as x approaches four, I can just plug four right in for x. And if you plug in four for X, you get six plus two, which is eight. So the limit as X approaches four of three halves X plus two is equal to eight. And then here's a, uh, another one. So the equation of a line seven, this is the equation of a line. It's just the, a straight line. It's a, a constant function, right? And so the limit as X approaches pi is just as we get to pi, it's the same thing. And so the limit for any value we put here is always going to be seven because a constant function is just seven. And so that um, is going to be our starting point for limits. So we can plug in limits or uh, we can calculate limits for any linear function or any line just by plugging in the value, even if the line is just a constant. Um, these ones are really easy because then the function value is just the limit. And so we have actually a bunch of laws for how we can compute limits. And I won't go over every single one of these. You can read these later. But I do want to point out some important ones. The idea uh, is that what you would want to happen with limits for the most part does. So if you wanna compute the limit of a sum of two functions, you can instead compute the limits individually and then add them, that's nice. If you wanna do a constant times a function, you can pull the constant out and then take the limit and then calculate it. If you wanna do the product of two functions, this is really nice, you can take the limit of one times the limit of the other and it'll work. You can do the same thing with quotient. If you want to take the limit of a quotient of two functions, you can take them separately as long as the bottom is not zero. If the bottom equals zero, then we have an issue. You can't divide by zero, remember? And if you take a power, same thing. And a root is the same thing as long as the function is positive when we have an even root, right? Because we need it to exist. And remember that for even roots, so when n is even, you need the inside to be positive for it to exist. And so let's do some, we can use these limit laws uh, to compute some limits, even if we don't know what the functions are. And so here's some, some kind of classic examples. So suppose we know that the limit as x approaches 2 of some function is 4, f of x is 4, the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is 5, and the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x is 8. So we just know those three pieces of information. We can use the limit laws to compute a bunch of different things. And so let's do a. So here's a. Copy that paste. So to do this, this by the limit laws by, so I'm just going to say theorem 2.3 by theorem 2.3, this is actually equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of the top, which is f of x minus g of x over the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x, because the limit as h as h, uh, x approaches 2 of h of x is not 0, right? So we can do that. And then we can use a limit law again, the quotient law, and take the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x minus the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x, 
all over the limit as x approaches to of h of x. And so now we're in position to plug in all these values because we know all of these values. And so this is again by theorem 2.3. And so we're using those limit laws to do that. And so now we can plug in all the values. We know the limit of f of x is four, the limit of g of x is five, and the limit as h is eight. And so we plug them in. So this is gonna be four minus five over eight. And so we get negative one eighth. So that is what the limit of this whole expression is right here. And all we did is we used the limit laws to take the limits of each individual piece and then compute it. We can do the same thing for this. So let's do the same for this guy. Let's use some limit laws. Actually, let me move this guy a little bit more over. Okay, let's use some limit laws. And so again, by theorem 2.3, we can pull out the constant. Uh, and it will be the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, and then times the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x, and then plus, and this using the sum law, the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x. And so now we have all the pieces we need. We can plug everything in. So this is 6 times 4 times 5 plus 8 and so I have no idea what that is. Uh, 24 times 5, uh, 120 plus 8, so 128. And so that's that limit. And so the idea is we were able to break up the, the quotient, or sorry, not the quotient, the product. We were able to break up the product because of the limit law. And we broke up, we split up the limit into two pieces and pulled the constant out. And so you can take the limit of each piece. And so that's the idea for this. And then finally, we can do, oh, that was not what I meant to do. Uh, let's do part C. Part C, the reason we can do this one is because by, again, by the limit laws, and because this root is not even, we don't have to worry about what the inside is. And so this is equal to the limit as X approaches two of H of X, and then I can put the power on the outside. And so this is equal to eight to the one third and the cube root of eight is two. And so we get that limit. And so I guess I should technically say this is by theorem 2.3. Uh, and a question I get a lot of times is how kind of, uh, how exact do I need to be on like using the limit laws and like right showing all the steps. In the beginning, I would say that you should show all the work just to get better in practice. But in general, I mean, I kind of skipped a lot of steps to go from there to there. Um, if you just show me that you've kind of broken up the limit, that that's fine too. And so this would be the minimum amount of required work I would want to see and the fact that you're using the limit laws. And so that's the idea. Okay, let's try using the limit laws on a polynomial like this. Let me uh, move this guy up. I might be able to fit all of this without going to the next page. And so how do we do this? Well, it's gonna be the limit as X approaches A of seven X cubed plus three X squared plus four X plus two. And so by the limit laws theorem 2.3, we can pull out constants, so it's seven, and then we can break it up over uh, the sum. And then it's just x and then to the third power. And we know how to do the limit of this because that's a, a line. And then plus 3 times the limit as x approaches a of x squared. And so because I, I can, this is a product, or sorry, it's a power of x. And so I can take the limit on the inside and then raise it to the third power. And then I can take the limit of that thing. And so what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm distributing the limit to every piece. And I'm gonna run out of space here. So let me actually move this over. And this, oh, sorry, plus using the limit law again, four times the limit as x approaches a of x and then plus the limit as x approaches a of two. And so I, now I can take all those limits because we know what the limit as x approaches a of x is, it's just a. 
And so this is 7a cubed plus 3a squared plus 4a plus 2. And what do we notice about that? Well, that's actually just equal to the polynomial evaluated at a, right? If I plug in a for each x, that's what I get. That's what this limit is. And so we didn't really prove it, but this kind of, I hope, illuminates or, or convinces you that the limit of a polynomial at any value is really just the function value at that polynomial using just the limit laws. And so that's really nice. Let me delete this page. So let me cut that and delete this page. Okay. And paste it right there. And so that's the, that's the result we get. Theorem 2.4 tells us that for polynomial functions, if you want to take the limit, you can just plug it in. So just plug in x equals a. So that, that's really nice. And you can do it for rational functions, which is a polynomial over a polynomial, provided that the bottom is not zero when you plug it in. And so this is really nice. And so you might ask the question, when are we allowed to just plug it in? Like if we can do it for polynomials and rational functions, can we do it for any function? And we can't quite say when it's okay to do direct substitution. So when the limit is actually equal to the function value, but when we get to continuity, we'll, we'll talk about it and we'll get to, we'll kind of say which functions are continuous and which ones we're allowed to just direct substitute it in. And so let's do an example here. And so in order to do this limit, we can try plugging it in. And as long as the bottom is not zero, we're okay. And so what is the bottom limit? So if we plug in, so just thinking about the bottom function right now, what is that? If we plug that in, you get five times two to the third minus 36, which equals uh, eight times five, which is 40. So it will be 40 minus 36. So it's four, which is not equal to zero. So we can use theorem uh, 2.4. So theorem 2.4 applies. So we can use that theorem. And so the limit as x approaches 2 of this function, which why am I writing it when I can just copy it? Copy, paste. So the limit is just equal to plug in 2. And so it's 3 times 2 squared minus 4 times 2 all over. And I already calculated the bottom, so I'm just going to write it as 4. And so what does that equal? That will equal... Oh, 3 times 4, which is 12, minus 8. So 12 minus 8 over 4. And so that just equals 1. So the whole limit is just equal to 1. Uh, maybe I shouldn't do it there because that's kind of confusing. <laughs> um, so that's what the limit is. The limit is just 1. OK. Uh, let me cut this page out. So that's a good example of how we can use that, that theorem. We just plug it in, right? So that's the nicest way to compute. How about with more complicated things? And what about one-sided limits? So we've been doing two-sided limits. But what about one-sided limits? And so all the limit laws that we work are the exact same except for the root law. For the root law, when it's an even root, it needs to be non-negative for it to exist. And so it's actually kind of the same. Um, but here's an example. The limit as x approaches 1 from the right of this function, this root function, is not equal. You cannot just take the limit of the inside and then take the square root because this limit right here does not exist, right? When x is bigger than 1, if you plug in numbers bigger than 1, this function just doesn't exist, right? Because you'll have a negative square root. And so in order for you to be able to do the limit laws for roots, it just needs to be it needs to be, you need to approach it from the right side. And so we can take the limit as x approaches one from the left, because if you plug in numbers smaller than one, it, it will work. Like if you plug in 0. 0.99, right? That would be a positive number, be square root of 0. 0.01, which would work. And so we would say um, this, this one side limit doesn't exist. And so here's a nice example we could do that on. Here's a piecewise function. And so remember how a piecewise function works. It's two parts, depending on what the domain is, right? So for x, that are less than or equal to one, you use this guy. And for x that are greater than one, you use this guy. And which is good because when you plug in things greater than one, this is this exists, right? If you plug in numbers bigger than one, it will exist. 
If you plug a number smaller than one, it's a line, of course it exists. What is the function value at the kind of split point at one? We plug in one to this one because it's less than or equal. So if you plug in one right here, you get negative two times two plus four, which is two. And so that's why f of one is two. And so we can find all the one-sided limits for this guy. So what is the limit as x approaches one from the right of f of x? Well, if I'm approaching it from the right, that's numbers that are bigger than one. I'm in this setting right here. And so it's gonna be the limit as x approaches one of square root of x minus one from the right, sorry, because we're bigger. And so because we're plugging in bigger values, this actually exists. And so it's just the square root of the limit as x approaches one from the right, x minus one. But this is just a line. So you can just plug in one. And so this equals just the square root of one minus one, which is zero. So the limit as we approach from the right is just zero. What is the limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x? Well, if we plug, if we plug in numbers smaller than one, we're now in this side. And so this is the limit as x approaches one from the left of negative two x plus four, but this is just a line. And so we can just plug in one. And so it becomes negative two times one plus four. And so it equals two. And so you'll notice that the limit as we approach from the left is actually just equal to the function value. But the two-sided limit does not exist because those two things are not equal. And so the limit as x approaches one of f of x does not exist because limit as x approaches one from the left of f of x does not equal the limit as x approaches one from the right of f of x. So the two one-sided limits are not the same. So it's not, the two-sided limit doesn't exist. Here's some other techniques. So what happens if we do get kind of zero over zero, right? If you plug it in, you get zero over zero. If you try plugging in, if you try plugging in, plugging in, x equals two, what happens? You get four minus 12 plus eight over, four minus four, that's zero over zero. So this is what's called an indeterminate form. And so we need to factor. We need to factor. Because what's kind of happening here is that there is a, a factor of two in both the top, or x minus two in both the top and the bottom. And so we factor. And so this limit, the limit as x approaches two, and again, I can just copy this, copy, paste. This is actually equal to the limit as x approaches two, and then factoring the top, you get x minus two times x uh, minus four. And then on the bottom, it's x minus two times x plus two. So that cancels with that. And so now we can just plug it in. This becomes the limit as x approaches two of x minus four over x plus two. Now plug it in. It becomes two minus four over two plus two, whoops, over two plus two, which is negative two over four. So this equals negative one half. So that will be the limit in that case. And so if you try, so whenever you have a rational function, even at the bottom is zero, you should try plugging in it. Because if you get zero to zero, it just means you need to factor. And so what about if it's not rational, right? What if it's not a polynomial over a polynomial? Then what do we do? So sometimes we're gonna have square roots. And when this happens, when it's zero over zero and you plug it in, there's a square root, we need to multiply by what's called the conjugate. And so the conjugate, so if you have A plus B, then A minus B is the conjugate. And the reason why they're called conjugate is because when you multiply them, you get A squared minus B squared. It kind of gets rid of the middle term. And so what's the conjugate for this one? The con oh, I guess we should try plugging in one first. So plugging in one. So try, try plugging in. That's the first thing you should always do. You should try plugging in x equals one. If you try it, you get square root of one minus one over one minus one, which equals zero over zero. And so indeterminate. So in determinate form, indeterminate 
Okay, so it's an indeterminate form. So now what do we do? So multiply by conjugate. So what is the conjugate in this case? The conjugate is going to be square root of x plus one. So you wanna to multiply top and bottom by square root of x plus one. The reason being is because that will get rid of the square root on top and will allow us to um, kind of do something nice. And so let me show you how that works. So if I wanna take that limit, I'm gonna multiply by the top and bottom by the conjugate over square root of x plus one. And the top just becomes a squared minus b squared. So it becomes x minus one. And then on the bottom, we have x minus one times square root of x plus one. And it's all the limit as x approaches one. But now this is really nice, which is why we do it. That cancels with that. And so this becomes just the limit as x approaches one of one over square root of x plus one. And if you plug in one into that, you get one over square root one plus one which is one half. And so that's the limit. And so this is another algebraic technique that you'll need to use in your homework. And I think that that is all. So you should have all the pieces you need to do your homework and I'll see you guys for the next section. All right, take care.